Good evening. And welcome to the final program in our Civil War series at the New Canaan Library. Tonight we explore Lincoln and emancipation. This lecture series was created in partnership with Noah Community College's regional series of events and exhibits focusing on Lincoln, the Constitution, and the Civil War. Several libraries and historical societies in the area are offering unique and exciting programming relating to these topics. And of course, all of this coincides with celebrations across the nation commemorating the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. I left some pamphlets if you're interested in what's going on regionally. Um, if there are none left down here, we have some up at uh, the information desk upstairs. Tonight I'm pleased to introduce Richard Allen Gerber, who will talk about Lincoln as politician, Lincoln in the Constitution, and what emancipation meant. Dr. Gerber received his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1967. His primary teaching experience is in constitutional legal history of the U.S. and Britain. He taught American history at Lehigh College of City University of New York from 1967 to 1985, the last seven years as chair of the history department. After a stint as academic dean and then academic vice president, he returned to the classroom at Southern Connecticut State University in 1992. He spent seven additional years at Southern's coordinator of academic planning and evaluation. He has written numerous scholarly works on the liberal Republicans of 1872, on aspects of the 13th and 14th Amendments, and on the methodologies of teaching history. Please join me in welcoming him tonight. presentation originated uh, when I was flipping through the TV channels uh, and uh, I had C-SPAN on and there was the House of Representatives and then there was the Home Shopping Network back and forth and back and forth and I think I bought a congressman <laughs> on sale too. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you out here on a, in the middle of the week uh, to observe this anniversary and I'm very grateful to Jeff Dano for setting this all up. Um, I'm going to uh, fuss at you for about an hour or to an hour and then we'll, uh, we'll take whatever questions or comments you have. And it, it, would I? Sure. Is that better? Okay. You want me to repeat any of that? <laughs> um, if you can't hear in the back, um, no, I used to ask my students in the back if they could hear, and they said, some of them said no, they couldn't exactly hear. And then I asked the people in the front if they could hear, and they said, yeah, they could hear just fine. And if the people in the back wanted to trade seats with them, that would be fine with them. <laughs> uh, in any event, I want to... Uh, share some thoughts with you tonight on Lincoln uh, and emancipation. Uh, the complexities of uh, President Lincoln's decision making about the freedom of uh, slaves, the, the end of the institution of slavery in America. It, for me, the most important, how can I put this? The issue of emancipation is so clouded by misconceptions and mythology and false truths that some of us get hung up in current attitudes about race relations and 21st century mental equipment. So right at the outset, let me just say to you that it, it doesn't make any difference whether you think Abraham Lincoln was some racist whitey politico or you think he was some noble grand emancipator or anything in between. What is significant is that we understand emancipation in the context of the Civil War. If you take it out of that context, essentially, um, it's a sort of a, a joke we play on the dead. So let's just keep it in its moment. Uh, I, there are three things, as Jeff suggested, um, uh, that I want to touch on. First, Lincoln the politician, uh, and then secondly, Lincoln's Constitution and finally emancipation process itself. So let me begin 
uh, with Lincoln, the politician. And let me suggest at the outset that Abraham Lincoln was a, a master political manipulator. Manipulation may seem like an unusual term here, uh, but it fits the scenario. Uh, the president did what he believed he needed to do to keep himself in office as president and to keep his party in power so that the union could win the war uh, and determine the conditions of the peace. We should also know that Lincoln was not particularly popular with the, with the people as such. He was not a charismatic president. Uh, it was not Theodore Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan or Barack Obama. He did not have that kind of charisma. And despite all the baffle gab about Lincoln's popularity with the common folks, uh, there's no real hard evidence, I think, that he was particularly popular uh, out there with the folks. He was also not particularly popular with the press. Newspapers called him every name in the journalistic lexicon. He was a slang-wanging stump speaker. He was a half-witted usurper, a mole-eyed monster with the soul of leather, the head ghoul at Washington, a puppet of Horace Greeley, as you see here in this uh, cartoon, and other choice morsels of political jargon. And the president was not really very much able to win support from the politicos, the politicians either. He certainly didn't win over the war Democrats, even though he offered to back New York Governor Horatio Seymour for president in 1864 if Seymour would just throw his party behind the administration. Well, Seymour refused, as you can imagine. And that shouldn't surprise us. In a dynamic two-party system, the president's not likely to win over the opposition. Uh, moreover, Lincoln couldn't influence Republican leaders either. Except for Gideon Wells of Glastonbury, Connecticut, my hometown, he's the guy with the big beard in the middle of that table, the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, except for Wells, there's very little loyalty to the president. Radical Republicans attacked Lincoln for failing to prosecute the war vigorously enough. They called him a political coward, a woeful ass, pitiable and too slow. Conservative Republicans condemned him for prosecuting the war too vigorously and for violating the Constitution. And they called him a dictator and a disgrace and everything the radicals left out. So Lincoln, how can I say, the, the problem was greater for Lincoln because the, the Republican Party itself was a combination of differing political, economic, and ideological interests. They sort of had hung together. Uh, over opposition to slavery in the territories, and now they faced a crisis about which they thoroughly disagreed. And Lincoln was in the dead center of that coalition. He became the target for everybody. Nearly every important Republican opposed a second term for Lincoln, including Charles Sumner and Salmon Chase and Horace Greeley Seward and Wade and Davis and Chandler and Browning and Grime, whatever, all of them. In 1862, I know this is 1864 because I couldn't find one that said 1862, <laughs> but in 1862, in the off-year midterm elections, the Republicans lost the crucial states of New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio and even Lincoln's home state of Illinois. And he was, as you may know already, a minority president. Well, I think it's fair to note that the outs almost always make gains in the off year. So maybe even that's not too unusual. But in this map, which is the 1864 map, Lincoln won an overwhelming victory in the electoral vote. 
Those are the orange states that you see on this map. The Democrat, George McClellan, carried the green states, and there are two. That's all. Nevertheless, 45% of the popular vote, the people, voted for McClellan. Lincoln won uh, because, as one Republican congressman put it, nothing but the undying attachment of the people to the Union has saved us from terrible disaster. Nationalism in this Thomas Nast cartoon, clad in, in the garb of saving the Union, this time saved Lincoln, too. This shows the grave of the Union if McClellan were to have won uh, the, elect, the presidency and made peace with the South. The Republicans also won because of their spectacular organizational skills. Those worked in 1860. They worked in 1864. Lincoln carried New York by 7,000 votes, a change of 83,000 votes total in the right places, 2% and Lincoln would have been defeated. Well, it did not happen, as we know. And it's really hard to enact your program, even an unpopular program, if you're not in office. So again, Lincoln was a master politician. He did keep his party in power. He's the first president since Andrew Jackson, the first in 25 years, shall we say, to win re-election. And beginning with Lincoln, the Republicans enjoyed 24 years of unbroken control of the presidency. So Lincoln knew how to operate the political machinery. He knew that you could not build your political victories by pronouncing yourself in favor of family values or by your personal charm or by your Harvard accent or even by your enviable war record. He tried very hard and very carefully to project himself as a kind of innocent babe in the Washington wilderness. Forget all that honest Abe stuff. He once told Republican leaders, you know, I never was a contriver. I don't know much about how things are done in politics. Can you imagine Lyndon Johnson saying that? Oh, the same thing. Same thing. So what was his strength? I want to suggest it was his use of patronage power. That is to say, the art of making the right appointment at the right time. When Lincoln picked his cabinet, he took leaders from every faction of the party, including many that he knew would never agree with him. And so he offered each group hope and no group dominance. The cabinet members were too suspicious of each other. They had little time to pick on the president and to be jealous. Secretary of State Seward met with Lincoln privately. And Lincoln's cabinet, Secretary of War Edmund Stanton, refused to discuss his war plans in the cabinet meetings because the, the, somebody leaked and they would go to the press and the next thing you knew, the Confederates knew everything. Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, quit coming to cabinet meetings altogether. Now folks, that is not efficient administration. It's not teamwork. Team of rivals, as we have heard, the kind of team we expect from the president, well, there were rivals all right, but not much teamwork. All three of those people, Seward, Stanton, and Chase, uh, were challenges for Lincoln's crown in 1864, and in the cabinet, they beat each other up. Lincoln also used his patronage to help defeat the Democrat McClellan in 1864. These are nuts and bolts, right? Now, nobody knows how much money the Republicans spent in 1864, and now we'll never know how much money anybody spends in presidential elections. But we do know uh, that the bulk of Republican campaign funds came from assessments levied on federal office holders. 
from cabinet members all the way down to janitors in the post office. You got a job from Lincoln, you were expected to contribute 10% of your salary to the party coffers. And if you didn't like it, if you were squeamish, somebody else could be found who wouldn't be quite so squeamish. This is a spoils system, pure and simple, when Lincoln was a pro. One significant use of patronage came in ensuring that enough Republican voters turned out to vote in the election of 1864. Lincoln knew that many states were going to be close, and so he wrote to General Sherman, whose army was in Georgia, anything you can safely do to let your soldiers or any part of them go home to vote at the election will be greatly in point. And at the bottom he wrote, this is in no sense an order. Well, of course it was an order, uh, and Sherman promptly obeyed it. Some soldiers mailed their ballots, as you see here. Many others got furloughed long enough to get home and vote and get back to the front. Still others, as in this Pennsylvania regiment, voted in the field. Indeed, if the Confederacy had known about this and attacked in full force, Lincoln might have lost the election uh, because the troops would have had to stay where they were and they would not have been able to go home to vote. And I note again, Lincoln carried New York by 7,000 votes, Pennsylvania by 20,000. He would have lost it except for the soldier vote. Midwest, very narrow majorities. In New York, the former commander of Union troops in New Orleans, General Benjamin Franklin Butler, as you see here, Butler put regiments of troops, Union troops, in the streets of New York City in case of riots, like the draft riots of the previous year. And incidentally, mind you, uh, to discourage Democrats, what he called democratic disturbances. And later, Butler wrote, I do not claim to be the hero of New Orleans. Admiral Farragut has that high honor, but I do claim to be the hero of New York City in the election of 1864, when they had an honest election, the only one before or since. Well, the Democratic organization, led by Tammany Hall, might well question uh, the propriety of Republican bayonets in the city streets, but again, New York went Republican by 7,000 votes. So Lincoln was flexible, that we can say. Just to conclude this little section, I know I'm going quickly, whatever else Abraham Lincoln was, he was, uh, he, uh, was able to adapt to changing circumstances. Master politico, who used the political process to stay in office. Okay, next customer, second section, constitutional <coughs> Interpretation, again, this will be graphic. In particular, uh, Lincoln's use of executive power was important given our experiences with Presidents Bush and Obama, and Lincoln's action deserved some attention. Whatever your personal views on this subject, it is historically fair to say that the Union could not have been saved had Lincoln stuck to the technicalities of the Constitution. He established what sometimes I call a quasi-presidential dictatorship. And Lincoln probably violated the Constitution every morning before breakfast. And that's what Jefferson Davis should have done too, although he did not, but Lincoln did, did excuse me. For example, whoops, I think that's the breakfast. Okay, good. Ah, we'll just leave him here for a minute. Who's that? Okay. Su suicide redhead, right? Died by his own hand. I'm sorry about that. Who? In any case, let's just back up a square here. Uh, Lincoln determined uh, the existence of a rebellion. And indeed, only Congress can declare war, as we know. Then he added men to the regular Army and Navy. Only Congress can do that. He had $2 million paid out of the National Treasury. Only Congress can appropriate money. He pledged the government's credit 
for a quarter of a billion dollars. Only Congress can deal with credit. The list is a lot longer than that, but that's the idea. And Lincoln readily admitted that, that many of his actions had been illegal. And if they had been judged by peacetime, peacetime standards, they would have been judged illegal. <laughs> they were absolutely necessary, he said, if the Union was going to prosecute this war to a successful end. And then he would ask Congress to ratify the actions he had taken, which they were happy to do. Uh, and that's exactly what Thomas Jefferson did. That's why he's here. Jefferson acted in that very same manner when he made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 and the Embargo Act of 1807 and what have you. And so with no constitutional authority whatsoever, may I point out, and Lincoln did exactly the same thing. As you look at this sort of intertwining of Congress and the presidency, please note that Lincoln claimed the power in an emergency to take any action that Congress could take. I want to repeat that because that's startling. He claimed the president could act for Congress up to the limits imposed on Congress by the Constitution. Anything beyond that, Lincoln certainly said, really would be unconstitutional because Congress couldn't do it and neither could the president. So what he was claiming, in short, that was in an emergency, that little line separating congressional power and executive power was muddied or even erased. Again, the president could not exercise powers not granted to the national government, but it, the emergency superseded the notion of separation of powers and eliminated the checks and balances that Congress exercised over the executive branch. Many members of Congress, particularly powerful, radical Republicans, were certainly traditional uh, when it came to the Constitution. These gentlemen established a joint, that means House and Senate Committee of 15, on the conduct of the war. Radicals were led by Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, powerful supporter of anti-slavery and equal rights and a founder of the Republican Party. And Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, a severe, tough-minded, uncompromising advocate of African-American equality. The Joint Committee would dictate congressional policy throughout the war and serve as a kind of a watchdog over the president, over this. They were not going to let this largely conservative president destroy the traditional powers of Congress under the Constitution. And they were going to make dadgum sure uh, that he did the right thing by the slaves. Americans approved Lincoln's actions. There was an overwhelming approval uh, by the great majority of Americans to Lincoln's unconstitutional behavior. Americans were so attached to the idea of union that they would, cons con they would accept even unconstitutional actions to save it. Well, you know, since 9-11, we have once again been learned to appreciate patriotism, good old-fashioned patriotism. That's exactly what we're dealing with here. Despite the scornful and despite the critical and despite the cynical in our midst, Lincoln people, the American people, were highly patriotic. They took what Lincoln did and they approved his work. Well, Lincoln did not stop with abandoning the separation of powers. He utilized executive power to repress dissent and suppress civil liberties of private citizens. He scrapped the idea that officers of the government were subject to the law and could not exercise arbitrary power over citizens. The problem was, as we look at this little picture of John Wilkes Booth, 
The problem was extensive pro-Southern spying and Southern attitudes in the border states and in Washington, D.C. There was sabotage. There was stealing of information about where Union troops were going to be located. There was recruiting for the Confederate Army. There was stealing of military supplies. There was carrying enemy correspondence and much openly voiced pro-Confederate oratory. And it was not uncommon for pro-Southern Northerners to find out where Lincoln's troops were headed and inform Confederate generals. Lincoln used his power, for example, to indict such people for treason or for conspiracy and then they were kept in jail awaiting trial for from one court term to another court term for very, very few excuse me, convictions. People who were indicted, however, were effectively quieted. And then most of the charges were allowed to drop. People including this former Ohio congressman, Clement Vallandigham, were not told why they had been arrested. They were just jailed by the army and military, even though there may be insufficient evidence for, uh, for their arrest. The usual process was to have a suspected person arrested by the military with no privilege of the writ of habeas corpus that gets you out of jail. Provost marshals were under orders to reject all civil writs People arrested would be tried by court-martial and punished by them. And we're talking here about several thousand people arrested and jailed, though very, very few, if any, convicted. In practice, again, these were precautionary, designed to prevent violence or interference with some government action. This is especially true of people identified as copperheads, as the phrase went, as in this cartoon, copperheads, pro-Southern Northerners who were considered dangerous. Again, arrests of short duration, those people normally treated well, but nevertheless arrested, we would argue, pr principally illegally and by a judge by any other standard. Well, was the union worth the price? That's the issue. Was the preservation of the union of such enormous importance that the government could use extraordinary powers even at the expense of civil liberties to obtain the, obtain the objective. The president held uh, that, the, that the union required any sacrifice. His opponents held that it would be better to dissolve the union, that would be less a disaster than the violence and bloodshed needed to preserve it by force. And you will, of course, decide that one for yourself. Okay, now, we're now going to go to emancipation, but first, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> smart-ass professor. Uh, in any event, again, emancipation, please keep this in the context of wartime. There were a number of factors operating that limited any, any rapid movement for emancipation. The first is good old-fashioned racism, the racist attitudes of 19th century America. Most Americans north as well as south shared a 19th century view of black inferiority. Given those kinds of racist attitudes in the Union as well as in the Confederacy, it's almost amazing that anything could be done to free the slaves. It's fair to say that Abraham Lincoln himself had no concept of black equality, certainly not as we understand that notion today. So there's one factor. Here's the second. The idea of a civil war as a giant insurrection, giant rebellion, that also operated against emancipation. In a war between sovereign nations, the conqueror had no obligation to respect the rights or the property of the defeated power. But remember, let's back up. 
even the hint of legitimacy of the Davis government in Richmond might bring on British recognition of the Confederacy and assistance to the South, which Mr. Lincoln could not risk. And so it was that the United States did not fight a war against a foreign country, but a totally an internal rebellion. Once the Confederacy gained recognition abroad, we might, we, the United States might lose well, might well lose half the nation. And might I remind you that an independent Confederacy would not emancipate their slaves. Moreover, the insurrection theory limited the drive for emancipation because under the Constitution, Southerners were still entitled to their rights, including their property rights, just as though they had been Northerners. If the government could not strip a Connecticut <coughs> citizen or a New Yorker or a Michigan citizen of his or her property rights without due process, then they couldn't arb arbitrarily take a Southern slaveholder's property either, or a Northern slaveholder's property for that matter. Whatever action was going to be taken against slavery would have to occur by constitutional means only. Okay. Third, maybe the most important powerful uh, uh, factor that limited emancipation, and that is the threat that Missouri, a Union slave state, or that Kentucky, a Union slave state might secede and join the Confederacy. If Lincoln moved too fast for, toward emancipation, those two huge slave states with enormous resources might secede, would secede, they said they would, and join the Confederacy. Leaders of Missouri and Kentucky made it clear to Lincoln that if he emancipated those slaves, those two states would join the Confederacy in an instant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please make no mistake with this. If Missouri and or Kentucky seceded, the Union can kiss the war goodbye from a military point of view. Those two states can, can contain too many men, too much territory, too many horses to take the risk of losing hundreds of thousands of men to retake them. Lincoln reminded his abolitionist critics that Kentucky was the third largest slave holding state in the country behind Louisiana and South Carolina. Somewhere it's gonna get bigger here. Whoops. Okay. A, a, a group of, uh, of ministers came to Washington to urge the president to free the slaves and they said to him, you know, you, you, you gotta free the slaves and, and Mr. Lincoln said, you know, if I free the slaves, I will take 50,000 bayonets out of the Union and give them to the Confederacy. Well, they, they you know, said, but Mr. President, if you do it, you'll have God on your side. And he said, I, I would love to have God on my side, but I need Kentucky. The point is, again, that if Missouri or Kentucky joined the Confederacy, the Union would lose. And please tell me again how, how a Confederate victory would free any slaves. And that is why when the Union commander of Missouri, General John C. Fremont, whom you see here, a man who had been the first Republican presidential candidate in 1856, a fiery abolitionist, Fremont was, he issued orders liberating the slaves of known rebels in Missouri, still in the North. And Mr. Lincoln promptly overruled him. People called Lincoln a hypocrite, but again, he could not risk the secession of Missouri or Kentucky. To Lincoln, any hasty action, however idealistic, would have caused those border states to secede, and boy, did he take heat from all kinds of anti-slavery people who used this incident to show that Lincoln was a racist who didn't care about anti-slavery whatsoever. Let me urge you, please, to see this in the larger 
context as well. Still another reason uh, limiting uh, emancipation, slaveholders held property protected by the state, by state constitutions and also by the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Americans generally believed that internal state institutions were their own business beyond the reach of the federal government. Moreover, the Supreme Court had already ruled by judicial interpretation in the Dred Scott case of 50, uh, 1857. The Chief Justice Roger Taney had ruled that slavery was indeed protected by the Constitution and that no piece of legislation passed by Congress to ban slavery could survive up against the Fifth Amendment guarantee of due process and just compensation. Anti-slavery legislation might make 20th, 21st century advocates of civil rights feel better, but any congressional anti-slavery laws would have been declared unconstitutional uh, by the Supreme Court. And again, let me emphasize that if the government simply wiped out property rights, why couldn't they also wipe out other constitutional rights to free speech or trial by jury or any of them? So here's a major point, folks. If Congress could not constitutionally emancipate the slaves, does anybody think that a president could eliminate property rights and slaves just by executive order? By executive order alone? No, it's not likely, is it? If Congress cannot pass a law depriving you of your property, can any just one presidential decree do that? Certainly constitutionally impossible under most circumstances. So once again, from a constitutional point of view, there were only two options to follow. The states themselves could free their slaves, doubtful, or Emancipation could be accomplished by constitutional amendment, also doubtful. Two-thirds of each House of Congress, three-quarters of the states would have to ratify that amendment. Where are those three-quarters of the states going to come from? You would need at least four of the Confederate states, the seceded states, to vote for it for it to be ratified. Now, it didn't, couldn't happen before the Civil War, and it's not going to happen during it. So southern states still in the Union by Union standards, and presumably all 15 of those southern states, the 11 seceded states and the four Union slave states could all vote no. So just to review for a second, a quick summary. Um, you're not taking notes, so we don't have to. OK. There were also some factors operating in favor of emancipation, now that we've got the other ones out of the way. Some huge pressures to emancipate. First, Abraham Lincoln's own strong anti-slavery views. Lincoln personally had always hated slavery. He said very simply, if slavery was not wrong, then nothing is wrong. But he also saw himself as president of all Americans, not just the anti-slavery Americans. I am naturally anti-slavery, he said, and yet I have never understood that the presidency conferred on me an unrestricted right to act officially upon my judgment and feelings. He explained over and over and over again that his purpose was to save the Union. In that famous letter he wrote to Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, a letter he wrote in August of 1862, and he said, this is Lincoln, my paramount object is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I, if I could save the Union by, without freeing any slaves, I would do it. 
And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. I'm hoping Daniel Day-Lewis will say it better than I do. But Lincoln was no hypocrite. He didn't have to believe in racial equality to be against slavery. Millions of Americans, however bigoted, held slavery immoral. You could believe that no one should own another human being without believing that everyone should be invited to dinner or have integrated schools. Well, Lincoln was typical of Americans in this respect. Well, what about colonizing African Americans abroad? Well, some folks proposed colonizing blacks in Africa or in Haiti. Even Abraham Lincoln, as late as 1863, counseled blacks that bare freedom would not put an end to discrimination. He recognized how hard it would be to persuade whites that blacks were first-class citizens. Colonization, at least, would give blacks a homeland of their own. Frederick Douglass talked Abraham Lincoln out of that position. America, Douglass said, was the rightful home of African Americans. The United States could not solve its racial problem simply by deporting it. America must deal with the issues of emancipation and equality squarely and live up to its ideals. Well, Douglas, Douglass's uh, arguments persuaded the president. And the point is, I guess, that whatever Lincoln's motives were, anti-slavery views or anti-slavery views or anti-slavery views. And Abraham Lincoln, flat out anti-slavery. Second, there was a need to prevent Britain and France from recognizing the independence of the Confederacy, and that worked in favor of emancipation. Without some moral cause, the Confederacy had the advantage in foreign circles. Much like the United States in 1776, the South was fighting for its independence. And without some moral cause, the United States was like Lord North in 1776, just crushing a rebellion. But the Union fighting for emancipation would throw the weight of world opinion against the Confederacy. And that is why Lincoln appointed, coming back to patronage for a second, why Lincoln appointed strong anti-slavery men as ambassadors to foreign capitals. This is Charles Francis Adams. He's an Adams, the Adams family. Not that family, the other Adams family. Uh, he went to London as ambassador. Or Carl Schurz, a German immigrant who had fought in the losing effort to overthrow the German monarchy in the revolution, revolution of 1848. Lincoln appointed him to Madrid, Spain, or John Bigelow to France, or Cassius Clay, the first one, to Moscow. Lincoln knew that those men would lend an anti-slavery cast to American policy, even though it was not officially the government's policy. And they, in turn, persuaded him that he needed to move against slavery or risk foreign aid to the Confederacy. Now, we don't customarily think about the reason for the Civil War as anti-slavery. We see it as a union matter. But there is one sense, ladies and gentlemen, in which this was an anti-slavery war and always an anti-slavery war. Once it became clear that this war would be long and lethal, there never was a moment's thought of bringing the defeated South back into the Union with slaves too. That would only leave the basic argument unresolved. We're not going to win this war and restore the South and slavery. Not going to happen. Some way would have to be found. Unknown yet, 
what way? But some way would have to be found to win the war and also to find some me method of emancipation. So the Union would have to be reconstructed without slavery, some way, somehow. Okay, third, there was a lot of abolitionist pressure on Lincoln, anti-slavery pressure, enormous, and I don't think we should underestimate this pressure. Abolitionists such as Wendell Phillips, Boston, continually beat down Lincoln's door with demands to take a firm stand on slavery. Or William Lloyd Garrison, who had once burned the Constitution because it supported slavery. Or black militant Martin Delaney, and of course Frederick Douglass, whose original name I think was Frederick Bailey. Fourth, there was a need for additional troops. There is a connection between abolition and the war effort. Northern governors told Lincoln that great numbers of anti-slavery people would not enlist in the army and they're not gonna fight just to preserve slavery. General Grant pointed out the need for men, especially for those who were waiting for the government to alter your position on slavery and will join up. And Grant cited the number of black troops, African-American men willing to serve in the Union Army, but they weren't gonna do it if the government refused to act against slavery. And as we know, nearly a quarter of a million African-American soldiers ultimately served in the Union Army. So again, here are those factors. We'll brief quick, quickie interview. All right. And so there were great pressures against emancipation and great pressures for it. For Lincoln, the real question was not whether, but how to emancipate the slaves without luring, losing Missouri or Kentucky and losing a war and without tearing up the Constitution entirely. In my view, this is Gerber's view only, but Lincoln was able to find a technique for emancipation precisely because of that same innovative attitude that he used to ensure his election and his exquisite sense of political timing. So now, let's see if that's the case. The first serious effort to destroy slavery in the southern states was something called the Confiscation Act of July 1862. This law provided that all slaves of rebels or people who aided the rebellion would be deemed something called captives of war or contraband if they were captured or escaped to the Union. So this is the technical term, contraband. It's an idea, by the way, concocted by Union General Butler, whom we saw before in the garrison in New York City. Contrabands. Slaves who ran into Union lines would be forever free under this law and never made slaves again. The Confiscation Act also provided for enrolling freed people, freed men, into the Union Army. It's interesting to note that this law was not truly enforced by the administration. It might have been, but it wasn't. And the reason is that Lincoln himself was moving toward a larger notion of emancipation by a means we just said was constitutionally impossible by executive order alone. So let's be clear about this. This is by executive order alone. Now, in, on September 22nd, 1862, as we know, president issued his preliminary emancipation proclamation. Now, for me, it's imperative to see Lincoln's reasoning here, even if you don't agree with it. The proclamation was a war measure. He would have said he was issuing this proclamation not as president of the United States, but rather as commander-in-chief of the army. 
in times of actual rebellion. The president, as a president, could not deprive a person of his or her property without due, uh, due process of law or jury trial, but the commander in chief could confiscate weapons of war that were being used by rebels against their rightful government. Slaves were just such weapons, contrabands of war, to use Butler's phrase. They could be seized and freed. Thus, Lincoln proclaimed in this proclamation that in all areas, still in rebellion, on January 1st, 1863, all areas still in rebellion, slavery would be abolished immediately and completely. Emancipation would take place in areas still in Confederate hands, not in Union hands. Now please understand this. The only emancipation could occur where Union armies had not yet conquered by January 1st, 1863. That's all. It didn't free slaves in the, in the Union slave states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware. It didn't instantly free anybody, yet. And some people thought, and some people still think, that emancipation was a sellout. But rather look, dare I ask you, at how politically perfect this timing of this very limited executive order was. In the first place, relying on his authority as commander in chief of the armed forces in time of actual rebellion, Lincoln circumvented the constitutional pro prohibition against federal interference with the internal institutions of any state. He got around that idea. Moreover, by freeing slaves only in the rebellious areas, he would not interfere with the rights of private property in the Union slave states. Missouri, Kentucky would not secede over that form of emancipation. And by issuing a proclamation, rather than letting events just sort of dictate policy, he appealed to the growing anti-slavery people, uh, 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 anti-slavery feelings of foreign nations, particularly Great Britain. So given the limited options with which Lincoln could work, I would argue this proclamation was a brilliant political maneuver by a brilliant political president. As commander in chief, he believed he could use whatever legitimate weapons of war were available. Well, eliminating slavery was a weapon of war. It was better than relying on state abolition because it, it got maximum clout abroad. It helped offset Confederate pres pressure on Britain and France to recognize the Confederacy. And of course, it was better than doing nothing because nothing was immoral. And at the same time, the proclamation encouraged abolitionists and promoted enlistment in the army. And it was better than total emancipation because any president who tried to wipe out the property rights of Union slave states could drive those Union slave states over to the Confederacy in an instant. And so, ladies and gentlemen, emancipation is no flaming manifesto of liberty. It never was. And that bothers a lot of people who simply don't appreciate the limitations under which Lincoln worked. It is, in my view at least, the ultimate tribute to Lincoln's sense of innovation and flexibility, again, in its historical moment, or else we don't understand it at all. Well, was the Emancipation Proclamation constitutional? Probably not, certainly not in our terms. Opponents of emancipation north and south condemned it as a gross usurpation of the power of the president. And folks, if you're one of those people who thinks Lincoln's suppression of civil liberties and his suppression of dissent was tyrannical, then what about this? This is clearly then tyrannical as well. 
Was it the right thing to do? A different question. Another story altogether. But probably unconstitutional. Even Lincoln said that if this proclamation ever got to the Supreme Court, it would not survive a challenge. So what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing less than the arbitrary confiscation of private property by executive order. Say it again, an arbitrary confiscation of private property by executive order. Lincoln said, I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution by the preservation of the Union. We should also note that in December of 1863, as Lincoln developed his plans for settling new loyal governments for Louisiana and for Arkansas, those states that were securely in Union hands, he included emancipation as a condition of those states being re readmitted to the Union. <laughs> while permitting civil government to be restored in those states, it was a condition of reconstruction then to abolish slavery. It's also useful to know that the Union slave states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, saw those reconstruction conditions as the, they got it. This was gonna be the ultimate demise of slavery. And those four states finally began their own emancipation process early in 1865. And so the Union slave states, too, would finally abolish slavery. That's the handwriting on the wall, spelled emancipation at last. Well, to make emancipation uniform throughout the nation and to eliminate all doubts that it was constitutional only an amendment to the Constitution would work. And remember how hard it is to amend the Constitution. There had been no change in the Constitution since Jefferson, 50 years earlier. It's hard to get two thirds of each House of Congress and three quarters of the state. Well, Lincoln pushed that am amendment anyway. There wasn't any choice. And finally, on January 31st, 1865, the 13th Amendment, the Anti-Slavery Amendment, did pass Congress. The 13th Amendment was the first constitutional amendment to change the substance of the Constitution rather than its rules or procedure. Well, there's a question about whether that ratification was legal. Was it? Well, it's questionable. Math problem. There were 36 states. So if you're gonna need three quarters, you need 27 states to ratify. The Union contained only five, 25 states, if you don't count the Confederacy. So two Union states also rejected the amendment, Kentucky and Delaware. So now we need at least four states out of the Confederacy to make 27 happen. December 18th, 1865, the official declaration of ratification was announced and the 13th went into effect. If you look at this picture, Congress went wild with enthusiasm about it. They counted eight Confederate states, counted as having ratified the amendment. Those Southern ratifications were made by provisional governments established under President Andrew Johnson's reconstruction program after Lincoln's murder. It is, I, might I say, with the utmost irony that is those same governments which Congress refused to recognize as valid for readmission to the Union. They were willing to let them stand as competent to ratify the Constitution, but not to sit in the houses of Congress. Abraham Lincoln did not live to see emancipation accomplished. He made the supreme sacrifice for it. Uh, I, I should stop here because I get a little too 
carried on. But let me just simply say that Abraham Lincoln, that emancipation was the first step on a very long road to racial equality in America. The road was still on. Uh, in any case, I thank you for your patience, and um, I'll be happy to entertain your questions. If you're looking at this as in darkness dwells the people, when it, that, that comes out of the Northwest Ordinance, and it is on the facade of Angel Hall at the University of Michigan, and I just couldn't help but plug. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Um, Thank you. 
motivation that they were discovering that white people were the ones who 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 were the
official representative of an organization they don't recognize, they don't recognize it. So there couldn't have been any formal negotiation with them. Could there have been informal negotiation? Not a question. But my sense is that there were not. Um, the bill was going to be brought to a military conclusion or a union that had been issued and even known by the Constitution that no one knew. This is the sort of pathology that I think is experimental. Why did you all want to share? Why did you bring in this whatever from this material?
despite the great stock trade, in 1863, Congress abolished slavery in the territory in violation of the Fourth Amendment, clearly compelling the destruction of two precious American lives. Uh, may I follow up on sure. the last point? Of course. Two quick points. One is really, I think, a different question.
a lot of good stuff from you guys. And I, I mean, I even have a friend here I asked him if he was a fan of yours. And he said, no, he's really not. So I said, again, not Captain Kirk. But in Captain Kirk, the cabin of us, uh, it was just fun to be people that were just there for each other. So here's a, a, a little bit of how a few people States are divided. There are lots of pro Southern people, especially in the South. They don't command the majority of the state legislature. Long had women command the majority of each of those state legislatures, where some of the people were from. However, half on property rights, even a slave owner would have been a bit more supportive. So it was just sort of an inside sort of thing that went on. Four southern and then four union states, but no more created after the early part of the 19th century than any of the states. Couldn't have been Thank you. 
this is what the tale of the apple tree is. Um, and I don't know if it's the tale of the apple tree or not. I don't know if it's the tale of the apple tree or not. Good question. I mean, is it all right for comic skepticism? Why is it all right for skepticism? I mean, no, openly and stuff. That said, in both cases, while they're meaningful, thematically, skeptical. One means is about revolution, the other is about suppression of revolution, and while they're totally different, the ultimate objective in both is the establishment of free men. Those are the institutions that are established uh, in the revolution and those that are not established in the revolution. How did the tale of the apple tree get about? How did the tale of the apple tree get about? How did they maintain their power? Well, one way to do it was to maintain it by property politics. <laughs> you have small governments that are disrupted, and you have privileged board activities, and you have privileged politics. Um, but you don't even have to have it as a reason. I mean, these are the people who are your wealthy neighbors. that support their own interests and they think the policies they have affect them whether or not they have that power.
We are paying to utilize public accommodation from 1764. Um, I, I want to point out, and I, I need to say this quickly, and then maybe Anna will uh, share with you. But there was a Civil Rights Act passed in 1865. There was a public accommodation law, very, very much like the 1964 law, which banned racial discrimination, hell, It included school integration as well. And that, 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 that hundreds of Republicans lost their seats campaigning for that act. Okay? That door was thrown away. And that came there. Okay? Thus, that didn't happen. So it was a major piece of legislation that almost no one ever thinks about. 1983, the United States Supreme Court declared it on
книгу братья нужны